Friends, I welcome you to my channel. Before listening to this story, I will ask you to like and subscribe. It is not difficult for you, but it is pleasant for me. And we're starting. I returned home when I was 29, after a failed marriage. My wife June cheated on me. I exploded. I beat her lover and his brother to a pulp when he intervened and spent the night in jail. However, my shark lawyer not only released me after one night, but also dropped the charges against me. One of her legal partners also ensured that the civil suit of these jerks was dismissed by mutual consent of the parties. When I returned to my hometown, a suburb of a large American metropolis, I had only a few thousand dollars, but there was no alimony, no child support. We didn't have children just because June didn't want them. No responsibilities, no promising new job. I was trying to figure out why I wanted to start all over again in my hometown. Probably it was due to the pleasant memories I had of growing up there, even though my parents now lived 2,500 kilometers away. I couldn't wait to see my old school friends, especially Jimmy Andrus. At first, Jimmy and I became close because of athletics, but we became inseparable because we found a common language at every level. In high school, with a height of 190 centimeters and a weight of 95 kilograms, Jimmy was a quarterback in football and a forward in basketball. At 2 meters tall and 110 kilograms in high school, I was an extreme in football and a strong forward in basketball. Although we weren't like Dan Fouts and Kellen Winslow in football or Earl Monroe and Dave DeBusher in basketball, we were good enough to win conference championships in both sports. After graduating from high school, Jimmy and I rarely saw each other in the summer because we went to colleges on opposite shores and my parents transferred me to the first year of college. However, our friendship was strong enough and I was sure that it would easily be revived when we met again ten years later. Although I was not good at social media, I followed Jimmy a little and met him for lunch in the third week of my return home. After we exchanged a manly hug, he said, Blake Jacobs, you're no different from our senior year in high school. Does life treat you well? I was still two meters tall and 110 kilograms and I was in good shape, but life treated me unfairly. I told Jimmy about my divorce and the night in jail, but then I immediately moved on to more pleasant things. Apart from a few wrinkles on your face, Jimmy, you don't look any worse either, I said honestly. Despite having three children and a difficult job, I still keep fit so I'm only two kilograms heavier than I was in high school, he grinned. I was pleased to see that his life was going better than mine. He was now the chief operating officer of a large private corporation that his father had founded. He had a wife whom he adored, and three young sons who were three, five, and seven years old at the time. You should meet Michelle and the boys as soon as possible, he said as we started eating. Come to Billy's basketball game on Saturday afternoon and stay for dinner, he insisted, since Billy was his seven-year-old son. With pleasure, I smiled. After spending 90 minutes with Jimmy, it seemed to me that we had been separated for only a month, not ten years, despite the fact that our lives had parted. Jimmy was at Billy's game with two of his other boys, five-year-old Sean and three-year-old Zach. They all seemed like great guys, and it was great to get back into athletics, which I hadn't had much to do with since college, since my ex-wife June definitely wasn't into sports. I was surprised at how big Jimmy's three sons were for their age. I was sure that Billy would become as strong a striker as I was, and not a defender like Jimmy. I stopped being surprised by their height when I met Jimmy's wife, Michelle Andrus. I imagined Michelle would be a petite, energetic, blue-eyed blonde like Jimmy's two girlfriends, at different times. Friends from high school. It's not like that. Michelle was the most intriguing-looking woman I've ever seen in my life. She had medium-length jet-black hair and black irises, which I hadn't seen before. Her face was not particularly beautiful, although it was rated at least eight points on a ten-point scale, but what distinguished her was her figure. As I found out later, because Michelle proudly told everyone who was interested about it, her height in the morning without shoes is 185 centimeters, and her weight is 70 kilograms. Although Michelle was the most attractive woman I had ever seen, and judging by the way she picked up guys and items, probably the strongest, her personality did not match mine. She, to put it as politely as possible, likes strong tea. In fact, it is a cup of green tea that is half cold. Bold and cheeky. Michelle ran the family like a real German, and without much help took care of their six-bedroom mini-mansion, with a gym equipped with the most modern equipment and a small media room with a cinema. Everyone, including Jimmy, was standing in line. I have to admit that the boys, 
although they were very active, otherwise normal children, were the most well-mannered I have ever seen in my life. As time went on, Michelle and I still didn't like each other. We were mostly pleasant to each other, but our relationship, although not conflicted, was wary. Despite the wary relationship that Michelle and I had, I soon became a member of the family. I helped out on weekends, taking the kids to one event or another, and Jimmy, Michelle, and I, most of the time I was with a girl, but sometimes without her, went out almost every Saturday night, including Jimmy's business events or charity events. After I had been at home for about 14 months, Michelle gave birth to another boy. I was especially helpful to Michelle with the kids. I treated them like my own, including coaching Billy's amateur basketball team while she was pregnant, including taking them out for the weekend if Jimmy was out of town and she needed a break. I was still surprised when Michelle and Jimmy unconditionally agreed that their fourth boy would be named Blake and I would be his godfather. I started crying, which made Jimmy choke and almost cry himself. And Michelle, who was feeding little Blake with one of her giant mammary glands, jokingly called me a pathetic weakling. To give you a more complete picture of Michelle's character and physique, I will say that six months after she gave birth to her fourth boy, she was as fit as when we met and still weighed 70 kilograms. I've always been curious about Jimmy and Michelle's relationship, given how accommodating he seemed and what a strong tea drinker she was. However, I was too polite to ask about it. However, when Jimmy and I stayed overnight in the country at a football match and he got drunk for the first time during my stay there, he opened up to me. She always sleeps on her back and wears a dozen custom-made bras that fit her perfectly and provide maximum support. And oh my God, it's worth it. I really regret that he told me all this because it was hard enough to suppress a boner in front of Michelle. And after this revelation, it was almost impossible. By the time my namesake, little Blake, turned five, Jimmy and I were 35, Michelle was 34. He was probably as close to becoming my son as possible. It seemed like we really suited each other, like Jimmy and I did in high school. I also had a great relationship with three other boys, especially Billy, whose amateur basketball team I continued to coach, and little Blake was my honorary assistant and who lived up to my prediction that he would become a strong hitter because he was the biggest and strongest guy his age in the league. Of course, life is not just a bed of roses, and for me and for the Andrus family, this became quite clear shortly after little Blake turned five years old. Jimmy was involved in an industrial accident at one of his company's factories, which he visited, and ended up in a coma in the hospital. Apart from a bump and a cut on his head lying in a hospital bed, he looked completely normal but this was not the case at all. The doctors had no idea when he would come out of the coma. It could happen at any moment, or God forbid, never. Fortunately, he had blue ribbon health insurance and disability insurance plans, so at least there would be no economic difficulties. Michelle took the situation as well as could be expected, but even her usually stoic appearance sometimes faltered, although she tried her best to stay strong for the boys. About the third time I visited Jimmy in the hospital, and it became clear that his coma was likely to last a long time. I promised him, not that he heard me or understood me, that I would take care of his family. Although Michelle rarely asked for my help, she never refused it when it was offered, and was grateful in her reserved way as much as she could. We got into a routine. On Wednesday nights, I took all four boys with me, sometimes on a particularly lucrative date, so that Michelle could spend some time with herself. For example... Go to the theater, cinema, or shopping with your mother or sister. Every Friday night, I brought pizza and salad for everyone at Andres's mini-mansion, and then I played board games or some kind of sports with all four boys. All Saturday and Sunday, I helped Michelle take the kids to places where they could spend the weekend, and sometimes spent Saturday nights with one or two boys if I didn't have a date. On Sunday, I also helped as much as I could. It had been going on for five months and the prognosis for Jimmy hadn't changed when Michelle called me at work on Friday morning. In her usual business-like manner, she told me that there was no need to bring pizza that evening, as something else was planned, and that she was supposed to arrive there at 7 p.m., and not at 6.15 as usual. I didn't pay much attention to this call until I arrived at Andrus's residence at 6.57, and when I entered, I never knocked, I was treated like a family member, and called the boys, there was no answer. Michelle came into the living room in a bathrobe after I had been there for a couple of minutes, and I was about to go in search of life. Hi, Blake, I'm glad you could come. The boys aren't around. I persuaded their grandmother, grandfather, and aunt to take them to my place for the night, although they won't have nearly as much fun as with you. 
We need to discuss something. Although she said it in a cheerful voice, it sounded a little ominous, but I was not afraid when she offered me a drink. She gulped down the brandy and poured herself another one, and then asked me to sit with her in the living room. After a long conversation with Michelle, to which I was not used, she gulped down her second glass of brandy, poured herself a third, and stared at me with her coal black eyes. Blake, I hope you understand how grateful the boys and I are for your help, and how Jimmy would appreciate it. We couldn't have done it without you, she almost gasped, and a rare tear rolled down from her left eye. It is a great honor for me to help. I feel like these boys have become the closest sons I could ever have, I replied sincerely. She smiled, wiped away a tear, and a second unbidden tear that was about to spill, and then continued. However, there is something else you can do for our family. I don't know if Jimmy told you, but I have an extremely high libido. Jimmy and I usually make love at least five times a week, even though we've been married for 14 years, she announced with determination in her voice. I thought it didn't concern me, but I just nodded, sure I was blushing. Anyway, I need you to take Jimmy's place, not only when it comes to helping the kids and me with daily chores, but also in bed. I dropped my glass. Fortunately, it was almost empty and consisted only of vodka and tonic, so the little that spilled on the floor didn't hurt anything. That, I, well, couldn't, that, seriously, he's my best, and, as if drop by drop, unfinished thoughts, not to mention complete sentences, came stuttering from my lips. Let me explain it to you this way, Michelle continued, clearly surprised at how stunned I was. I can't do this anymore. I need to satisfy my needs. If you don't help me, I'll probably go and make love to random guys. Would Jimmy like this, or would he prefer that his best friend, someone who he knows will treat me well and respect me, satisfy my needs? With that, she stood up, took off her robe, which was the only piece of clothing she was wearing, and walked towards me. Take me to my bedroom. You might think that dragging a woman weighing 70 kilograms up the stairs would be hard. By the time we were in the shower together around 9.30 the next morning, I suddenly realized that what Jimmy had told me in a drunken state a few years ago was true. Since I have such a good relationship with Jimmy and Michelle's four sons, I was only glad when they were told that from now on, Uncle Blake would spend the night with them on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. The three younger boys had no idea of the consequences of this, but after three weeks, Billy, who was now almost 14 and mature for his age, understood. I thought there might be some problems with Billy, so one summer on a weekday, we went to basketball camp for the whole day, had breakfast together, had lunch there, and then had dinner together. When we were driving home, I really got close to him. Billy, you're old enough to know that your mom and I are in a real relationship now. What do you think about it? He paused for a moment and then smiled. Before you started staying with us on weekends, it was very difficult for mom. At times, she was even rude to us children, which was unusual for her. When she apologized to us, it became clear that the lack of communication, combined with anxiety for her father, had a negative impact on her. Now, with the exception of about an hour that has passed since she returned home after visiting her dad in the hospital, she has returned to normal. I'm really happy for her, and I understand that you and she are doing your best in this difficult situation. I don't mind if you stay the night. I actually cried. This also brought tears to his eyes. I hugged him tightly, and then, looking into his eyes, I said, If something changes, I want you to discuss it with me. I appreciate our relationship. Billy smiled. No problem, Uncle Coach, he said and then laughed. I never told Michelle about it, but I knew she had her own demons to fight. However, when we were in each other's arms, there was nothing but pleasure. While we were in bed, she did everything in her power to make me the most satisfied man in the world, and I tried my best to reciprocate. Guilt even made me tell Jimmy about my relationship with Michelle. I visited him in the hospital at least twice a week for an hour or two, usually late at night on weekdays. I discussed our favorite professional and college sports teams as if we were having lunch together and told him how the boys were progressing in lacrosse, basketball, swimming, soccer, or any other sport of the season. After talking about sports and family, I would become real for a few minutes and tell him that I had slept with Michelle. I tried to put a positive spin on it by saying that she and I were just meeting our basic needs and that she only loved him. I never went into details, but my stories weren't boring either, and I often wondered how right he was when he claimed that she was the best partner in world history. The best news for the Andrus family, 
And at the same time, the best and worst news for me came simultaneously 15 months after Jimmy fell into a coma and 10 months after Michelle and I began to meet our basic needs. Jimmy literally broke out of his coma. It was Thursday afternoon, although he would still have to stay in the hospital until he regained muscle tone. He would not have undergone numerous physical and neurological examinations and would not have undergone various types of therapy. That Friday, Michelle and I had our last night together. It was so bittersweet. The next morning we were both crying like babies, but we knew we had to put an end to it. I was especially sullen because I knew that any partner I would have in the future would pale in comparison to Michelle. And although our relationship was still somewhat low-key outside the bedroom, inside the bedroom, our relationship was uninhibited and epic. While my bedroom relationship with Michelle ended, my relationship with the Andrews family continued. I still did everything I could to help Jimmy with the boys and adjust to life again. Once he came out of his mysterious coma, he predicted that he would probably be able to live the rest of his life almost the same as before the accident. I was particularly surprised that Jimmy had no problems remembering his relationship with me. And for two months after his discharge from the hospital, we seemed to be as close as ever. Then a really strange thing happened. One day I drove Jimmy, baby Blake, and Billy home after a football game, and Jimmy invited the boys into the house saying, Boys, go inside. Uncle Blake and I need to talk about something. I thought it might be related to his business, which I was almost aware of. Instead, he attacked me with the words, Blake, I want to thank you for taking care of Michelle in the bedroom while I was unwell, and for gracefully leaving when I came to my senses. It must have been difficult, considering how pleasant your life with her was. Damn it. Uh, how? Uh, you? Did you find out? I stammered. Did Michelle tell you? No. I think Michelle is too embarrassed to discuss this. You told me about it at the hospital, he replied calmly. What the fuck? That was my stellar answer. Did you hear me? Yes. During rehabilitation, the doctors were very impressed by my memories of events and words that I heard about the third month of my stay in a coma. I remember almost every word you told me about your relationship with Michelle. I know why you told me this. You're a good friend and you were plagued by guilt, but you believed her when she said she'd get it somewhere else if not from you. I know her and she didn't lie to you about it. I'm grateful that my best friend really cared about her and the boys, and not that she got involved with some jerk, he said decisively. God, Jimmy, I do not know what to say. I still feel so damn guilty, and to be honest, I'd rather you never found out. But to say that I'm grateful to you for saying that would be the understatement of the decade, I somehow managed. Jimmy seemed to really believe what he was saying, and there was no obvious dislike as I continued to treat his family as my own. Although the relationship with the boys was wonderful, I noticed that Michelle began to treat me a little warmer than before our relationship, but it bothered me that sometimes I caught her staring at me or just into space. About three months after Jimmy's conciliatory conversation with me on Tuesday evening, there was a knock on my apartment door shortly after I returned home from work and changed out of my suit into shorts and a t-shirt. It was Michelle, wearing a raincoat despite the clear sky. Blake, I need to talk to you about something. She mumbled rather than said. There was an expression in her coal black eyes that I hadn't seen before, or at least hadn't noticed. They looked kind of desperate. I really didn't want to be alone with her, but at the same time she was my friend who clearly needed help, so I invited her in. Michelle got straight to the point. Blake, Jimmy has changed since he got out of the hospital. He's not as passionate as he used to be, and I'm suffering. I remember the time we spent together, and what I miss right now and I need to get into a relationship with you, even if it's only once a week. She blurted out, at the same time taking off her raincoat, the only piece of clothing she was wearing, not counting high-heeled shoes. I tried to resist. I tried honestly and sincerely. However, the more she pressed on me and literally begged, the more I remembered the most intense time in my life and felt that my resolve was weakening. I even tried to lock myself in my bedroom, but as I said earlier, she was the strongest woman I had ever met, and in order to close the door in front of her, I would have to really hurt her, which was impossible for me. Given Michelle's desperation and the fact that I haven't had a bed since I last used it more than four months ago, our intensity was even higher than in the past. I didn't think it was possible. When she took a quick shower without my help and put on her raincoat again after those two hours of bliss, she kissed me hard. I need you to call me on my cell phone to make arrangements for the future she said and left my apartment. 
I didn't have dinner that night. I did nothing but take a shower and mindlessly stared at the TV, not even suspecting that there were programs on there that I hated and that I had never watched. When I finally woke up from a restless sleep the next day, I knew what I needed to do. I couldn't become the asshole my ex-wife June was making love to. I had to leave. Thanks to the excellent recommendation of my current boss, despite the fact that I notified him of his dismissal in a short time, and the help of my father's acquaintances, in three days I passed three interviews in the city where my parents now lived and notified my landlord that I was vacating the rented apartment. That Saturday, I broke the news to the Andrus family. The boys were crying. Jimmy burst into tears. While everyone else was worried, Michelle left the house. I knew she had gone to the barn in the backyard, having come up with some lame excuse that the others bought into. I tracked her down. I found her in the barn, devastated. I grabbed her wrists and held her tight. At first she tried to pull away, but I was determined and held her tight. When we looked into each other's eyes, I told her that I fell in love with her, which was 90% true, but that I couldn't stab Jimmy in the back or become an asshole who used my ex-wife, which was 100% true, so I had to leave. In my new home, I kept in touch with the Andrews family, mainly through social media, but also by phone. Little Blake and Zach, the second oldest boy, came to visit me twice, each time for a week. I analyzed videos of Billy playing in high school and gave him some tips. I even spoke to Michelle on the phone twice in the presence of other family members, once to congratulate her on the birth of her fifth child. They named the fifth child, a little girl, the first female child in the Andrus family, Amanda. With four older brothers, she was really spoiled. With the exception of my personal life, everything was going well in my new city, especially at work. I enjoyed my job and started making really good money for the first time and I was able to immediately buy a very beautiful three-bedroom house on a large plot with a swimming pool and a basketball court. I went on dates and made love from time to time, but Michelle spoiled me for other women. I have never found anyone who is close to special. It was almost four years after I broke up with the Andrus family. I was 41 years old when I started having problems communicating with them. For about two months, I rarely received replies to emails or text messages and did not get in touch by phone. On a Wednesday in the summer, I was in my office when I got a call on my mobile. It said on the phone that Michelle Andrus had called, although I didn't recognize the number. Hi, this is Blake Jacobs, I replied, not sure if it was really Michelle. Hi Blake, this is Michelle. I hope you're still doing well, she began. We chatted for just a minute and then she got down to business. Some members of the Andrus clan are coming to your city this weekend. Are you ready to receive some guests? Of course. Who's coming? I asked. I'm not sure about the exact composition yet, but we promise not to overload you, she replied. Of course, come, I'll be glad to see you guys. When do you expect to arrive? Towards evening. Maybe by one o'clock on Saturday afternoon, if you don't mind. I'll be ready. Let me tell you the way in case your GPS doesn't work, I replied. The call was cut off as quickly as it came in. I was puzzled, but at the same time glad. I thought that I had done something wrong and that members of the Andrus family had ostracized me, but apparently that was not the case. Despite the fact that I usually keep my house clean, I'm just one step away from the obsession with cleanliness, I wanted everything to be in perfect condition, so I hired a cleaning service to do a thorough cleaning, hired a jack-of-all-trades to fix some small things, bought a few items to complement the interior a little, gave this place an aesthetic appearance and made sure that the pool and basketball court were in perfect condition. On Saturday at 1.04 p.m., not that I was keeping track of the time Michelle drove up in her van for seven passengers, two excited boys jumped out of it, baby Blake, who was no longer small, and Zach, who visited me last summer. After I dealt with them, I saw Michelle come up to me holding the hand of three-year-old Amanda. I've only seen a few not-so-good photos of Amanda. When I saw her in person, I realized what this trip was for. I hugged Michelle. I knelt down and held out my hand to little Amanda. But instead, she hugged me with a gentle but strong, girlish hug. Michelle, who is now 40, looked the same as when we first met. She had an open stomach, showing off her impressive curves. No, this morning I weighed 71 kilograms. I'll have to add a little more, she grinned back. I quickly determined that these four were the only visitors. Billy, Sean, and Jimmy weren't going to come. I cooked them lunch, and then I gave them a tour, Zach, and baby Blake showed them many things they were familiar with, including going down to the pool and the retractable net behind the basketball shield. 
It was a hot day, and the children begged to go swimming. Amanda could already swim, and Zach was the doting older brother we could trust to look after her. So Michelle and I sat sipping iced tea in the shade, where we could watch the frolicking children, but we weren't mother hens. So when did you find out that I was Amanda's biological father? I asked brusquely. As soon as I saw Amanda in person, it was like looking at photos of my mother when she was very young, including her very distinctive eyes and forehead. I was sure that was the case as soon as I found out that I was pregnant, about a month after I left your apartment, when we used each other senselessly that Tuesday night, a few days before you left. I had the most fruitful period when I wasn't on birth control and Jimmy was only partially doing his job at the time, she replied casually. When were you going to tell me? I asked. Shortly after Jimmy figured out what he had done about two months ago, and that's why the connection on our side became weak, she replied casually again. How did he know? DNA test. What was his reaction? That's exactly what I was hoping for. He filed for divorce. Why did you hope for this? Because I want to be with you, not him. Ever since his accident, he hasn't been himself, and even before that, he wasn't up to you in bed, she replied, looking through me with her coal black eyes. What makes you think that I want a relationship with you? I asked. You're not divorced yet? I'll be back in a month. We have already divided the property by agreement. Jimmy looks after the house. Billy is going to college this fall, and Sean wanted to finish high school in his hometown. I got full custody of Zach, Blake, and Amanda, and they were happy to move in and live with Uncle Blake. Even Amanda when her brothers told her how wonderful you are. And when I explained to her in the best possible way how a three-year-old child can understand that you are her real dad, Michelle declared, where are you going to spend the night? Here, of course. Our luggage is in the car and our supplies will be delivered by truck on Monday. The boys will sleep in a room with bunk beds, just like the last two summers when they came to visit you. Amanda will have a guest room and she will like it as soon as we renovate it. I'll sleep in bed with you. I do not know how much you will sleep, especially in the first week, but we will sleep in the same bed with you, she replied coldly. Of course, I wanted to show my superiority. I wanted to let her know that I'm not a wimp. I wanted to show her that she can't just show up here and tell me how my life is going to develop. I wanted to do all this, but I didn't do it. I looked at little Amanda, who was giggling and jumping into little Blake's arms in the pool, and my heart was filled with paternal pride. I thought about how happy my parents would be to become grandparents. I looked at Michelle's smooth, muscular thighs and vividly remembered the pot of honey between them. I looked into Michelle's eyes and felt the passion radiating from them seep into my brain. So, after a minute's pause to maintain the illusion of control, I replied, Sounds like a plan. Michelle and I have been married for three years. We won't have any more children in the near future because Amanda's fallopian tubes were bandaged when she was born. But Zach and little Blake are like family to me, and Amanda is the light of my life. End.